being a part of this awesome event uh, and for turning out for Bike to Work Day. It was a success this morning. It was pretty good. Yeah. We got up and uh, we had blue skies. We had cool, crisp weather. Uh, and uh, I know that the gathering down at Public Square was fantastic. I heard something like 150 people, Nashville's most significant showing for Bike to Work Day. So it's fitting that we're here to celebrate that as a group from across Tennessee. Uh, it's my pleasure to get started this morning by introducing uh, Nashville Davidson County Metro Mayor Carl Dean. Mayor Dean is the sixth mayor of Nashville Davidson County. He previously served as the director of law under Mayor Bill Purcell and he served as the city's public defender from 1990 to 1998. Uh, we are pleased and honored to have Mayor Dean here uh, to share a few words with us this morning, and I'm told that he's a Red Sox fan, and that occasionally, if you see him <laughs> riding around town on his bicycle, you could see him in his Red Sox. So, Mayor Dean, I want to welcome you here. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you. I am a Red Sox fan, and, and Kim, I think the mayor of New York is a Red Sox fan. <laughs> so, I mean, you talk about political hurdles to get over. That's a, that's pretty, that's a pretty big one. Uh, well, first, thank you, Anthony, for that introduction, and thank you to uh, both B uh, Bike Walk Tennessee and uh, Walk Bike Nashville for organizing this year's event, um, I'd like to thank the BPAC members and all the volunteers who worked hard to get this uh, to get this done. And from all of you from out of town, I hope you have an opportunity to get out on the greenways uh, and enjoy the city. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot that you can see on a bike, and this is a perfect time to do it during uh, National Bike Month. So thank you uh, for coming to Nashville. Um, I, my sense is that there's a lot of good things happening all over the state, that uh, whether it's from Memphis to Johnson City and Chattanooga and Knoxville, that there is a lot of progress being made, and it's, I'm really happy to see that. I mean, biking is one of the things, actually, I think, that brings us as a region in Middle Tennessee closer together. Um, you know, when you think about greenways, uh, you know, greenways have been largely... Um, investments made by within counties, within cities and towns, and of course Nashville being a metro made within our, our, our area government. But the, the, the future for greenways I can see as being a great regional concept where they tie together um, a region. And people who bike in Nashville spend a lot of time biking in Williamson County and vice versa. Those are sort of things that bring people together. I think the possibilities of greenways and biking from Nashville to Rutherford County is something that um, will be pursued in the future and, and will be a good thing for the entire, um, for the entire city and, and for the region. I want to, um, you know, tell you that I, I am a big supporter of biking. I think it's an important part of what we need to be doing as a city for a couple of reasons. And I don't really want to rank them in importance, but you know, one is obviously transit. Um, as many of you know, I'm kind of spent a lot of time talking about transit. Um, I, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I really believe that as a, as a city, uh, we are a good decade behind the cities that we probably compete with most directly, uh, Austin and Charlotte, when it comes to mass transit. I think that as a city, that is vital for us to continue to invest in transit in order to make sure that we retain our quality of life and our competitiveness. And so that is something that's on my mind a lot. Um, it shouldn't be lost on any of us that um, according to... Um, to the experts, the greater Nashville area, the 10 county region, is going to grow by a million people between now and 2035. All right, so just to visualize that, that essentially means the Nashville area will be the size of what the Denver area is now. And then we'll be pushing up to be about the size of what the Seattle area is now. And that presents us with a lot of challenges. And quality of life is, is a big part of that. And biking adds to the quality of life. Biking adds real transit um, alternatives for folks. And it's an important thing for, for us to embrace. The other thing that appeals to me about biking is its relationship to health and being a more active city. Um, Kim, this is the battlefield on the issue of obesity is right here in the south. 
Um, if you doubt me, go out to lunch. There's a variety of places you could go to, which I go to and love. Uh, but we in the South like our food, and we uh, actually prefer it fried in all cases. And, um, it, and it will be, it, and so in Nashville, we have 38% of our kids who are considered obese. Right? And, and the adult numbers are similar. And when you stop and think about that, what that means is that 38% of our kids are suffering from a condition that if left untreated, if left unrecognized and dealt with, that they are putting, they're in a position where they are much more likely to suffer from diabetes. They're much more likely to suffer from heart disease. I mean, there's a direct connection, a direct connection. And it, obesity is also linked to cancer. So making a city bikeable, walkable, runnable, are things that help us become more active, to become a more engaged city that creates a better environment of, for health. And health, to me, again, is not about how you look. This isn't, you know, we're not, uh, you know, I, I'm not striving to be a model. Uh, that's a good thing that I'm not striving to be a model, because that would be, I'd be unsuccessful. But, and it's not about being perfect. It's about being healthy. It's about people living long, happy lives and having the opportunity to enjoy life. And that's what, we, that's what we're working on. And so building the infrastructure that is necessary to promote that is of vital importance. Uh, we like to say that we want to make in Nashville the healthy choice, the, easy, the healthy choice to be the easy choice that if you want to walk, that there are sidewalks. If you want to walk, there are greenways. If you want to go to a park, that there are parks. If you want to bike, that there are bikeways to, to, to use. And, and so those things become an easier choice and encourages a more active um, lifestyle. Since taking office, uh, we've invested more than $130 million in public infrastructure to promote health. Active living, that includes sidewalks, bikeways, community centers, parks, multimodal streets, and public health um, facilities. Um, I filed the capital plan for next year with the council yesterday. In that is more money for bikeways. There's $17 million, I think the highest number we've done, and certainly a, a big number uh, for the history of Nashville, uh, for sidewalks. Um, and, and so that is what we're trying to do to build a foundation for a healthy city. Currently, we have um, 140 miles of bike lanes in Nashville with um, 100 of those that have been built since I've, I've taken office. But building bike lanes is just a start. We also need to ensure that uh, the bike lanes offer comfortable and enjoyable riding for all levels of riders and that they connect to one another. A great example of this is a project that uh, Metro Public Works just completed, a new extension of one of our complete streets on Korean Veterans Boulevard that's uh, not far from here. It's behind the, the new convention center. The new KVB bike lane extends from Hermitage Avenue to South 4th Street. And these bike lanes have state-of-the-art design that includes a designated buffer zone separating the bike lanes from the adjacent travel lanes. In addition, bike lanes along Charlotte Avenue from I-40 are expected to be installed this summer, and they, this will extend uh, the existing bike route to the North Gulch Greenway for an additional quarter of a mile. And just this week, we announced the plans for a streetscape improvement project that further enhances the Music City bikeway through Sylvan Park neighborhood, uh, one of uh, the city's most vibrant and active neighborhoods. This project will include a roundabout, new sidewalks, better lighting, and attractive landscaping. It's a great example of how a multimodal street can contribute to the vibrancy of a neighborhood. But it's not enough to just build the infrastructure that supports um, healthy living. We need to encourage and inspire biking and active living for all Nashvillians. Uh, to me, it's important to um, uh, create a culture of biking to uh, have a transition of the idea that people can use bikes to get to work or to go to uh, social engagements, uh, to commute for recreation, away from just being considered sort of an exotic alternative form of transit. It takes many steps to get there, uh, and the first step, of course, is building the resources that, that create a bike culture. 
One of those tools that we have is a free mobile app for healthy activity called Nash Vitality. The Nash Vitality app includes all the bike lanes, greenways, bike parking, and other amenities um, to enjoy biking throughout the city. And I believe it's the first app of its kind in the country. It's simple to download the app uh, on your iPhone or Android device, then click on bike and road routes to view all the great uh, biking routes around the city. One of the tools in the app is the Nashville Groove Map of easy riding routes uh, across Nashville that interconnect neighborhoods and highlights uh, comfortable cycling for all levels. The Groove makes it possible for cyclists of all skill levels to uh, comfortably bike to and from parks, schools, workplaces, attractions, and business districts. Both the Groove and the Nash Vitality app were developed by cyclists. So it's uh, easy to use when you're on a bike. Another program that has greatly contributed uh, to building a bike culture in Nashville is the B-Cycle program, our bike share system that we launched in 2012. Nashville um, has a very successful program. At the end of last year, uh, B-Cycle had the most trips ridden during the first year of operation, uh, second only to Denver B-Cycle's uh, first year of operation. With over 63,000 bike checkouts and more than 750 memberships since its launch, it's clear that uh, B-Cycle is doing a great job and the people in their city and the tourists are, uh, are excited about using that system. In fact, today at 11, we're opening another B station uh, thanks to a new sponsor, uh, St. Thomas uh, Midtown Hospital. With this additional station, in total, Nashville B-Cycle will have 23 kiosks, and 207 uh, bikes around town for riders to check out for quick rides uh, during and after work. And this location is just blocks away from the Music City Bikeway on Charlotte Park, uh, which gives uh, the alternative of having a longer ride. Another project that I'd like to highlight is a policy that just passed last month, a new bike uh, parking ordinance for new and uh, existing buildings. Thanks to BPAC and our planning department, this ordinance passed Metro Council with great support. It requires a minimum, of bike, a minimum of bike parking for any new construction or developments expanding more than 50% within what is referred to as our city's urban core, sort of the center city. The bike parking ordinance was another great step to reduce, hopefully, congestion on Nashville streets and offer more amenities to cyclists. Nashville has other exciting uh, in, in initiatives that are going on, and I encourage you to check them out. Uh, one great way to do that is to participate in the Tour de Nash tomorrow. Um, the Tour de Nash is one of my favorite healthy events. It's a great way for families to get together and bike. It's not a race. It's fun. You get to go. Races can be fun, too, but this is just all for fun. And you get the opportunity to see a great part of the city. Um, I would uh, like to just conclude by thanking everyone involved uh, with cycling, our BPAC folks, our cycling groups, and the statewide efforts for what you do. Um, you know, you've been doing this in many cases for a long time. And uh, I think real progress is being seen throughout the state. And I encourage you to hang in there and keep doing it. I, I think, you know, four, five, ten years from now, um, our city, other cities are going to be transformed by your efforts, and I'm, I'm, I'm indeed thankful for that. Nashville is a Browns level bike friendly city, and it's my goal for us to um, only do better in the future and, and obtain even a higher ranking. So I hope you enjoy the conference, enjoy uh, our city, spend some time at the honky tonks. That's what uh, everybody who comes to Nashville needs to do. And uh, as I as I said to the group this morning, uh, spend some money. We're doing the budget right now, and <laughs> you know it's 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 just it's tough. So anything you want to do to help, we appreciate. Thank you. Thanks so much to Mayor Dean for being here with us today, and for all the support that uh, he's shown to this issue over the years. And um, I'm sort of ashamed to admit this to a crowd uh, here in Tennessee, but I took my first bike share trip yesterday. <laughs> Mayor Dean mentioned the bike share program. I have to be honest, the bike was already checked out and I was just returning it to the station. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I was on the bike.
Yeah, right, it still counts. Um, I think among, among the many great things Mayor Dean has done for this city and now for our state uh, was to hire Tokes Amashakan uh, to work here in Nashville to help launch this city's efforts to promote biking and walking and active transportation. Tokes now serves as the Assistant Commissioner and Chief of the Bureau of Environmental Planning at the Tennessee Department of Transportation. And he previously served here in Nashville as the Director of Healthy Living Initiatives under Mayor Carl Dean. And he really was responsible for launching the Complete Streets initiatives that um, are now, I think, taking hold not only here in Nashville, but across the state. And I just want to make a quick comment about Tokes. Uh, when we first started this program, the, the Tennessee Bike Summit in Chattanooga three years ago, Tokes was there. When we had this program in Memphis last year, Tokes was there. And we are here in Nashville today, and Tokes is here. He is a stalwart who is committed to this issue, who has shown us at every turn what it means to be a leader and to take initiative, particularly at the administrative level. So I want to thank him for that and welcome him here to the third annual Tennessee Bike Summit. Thanks, sir. Appreciate that. Good morning. Um, if I ever need a campaign manager, when if I'm running for office, uh, Anthony, you're locked and loaded. Uh, you're you're my guy. I've never had somebody pump me up like that before. Make me feel way more important than I am. But uh, thank you anyway. Um, so I, I'm excited uh, to be here at the third. Um, uh, we, we got some. We're, we're going to get up here in, in a second. I'm assuming. Okay. Excited to be here at the the third um, event, uh, third annual uh, bike summit. Um, the number seems like it's uh, grown a little bit. Uh, Memphis was uh, Memphis was cool, uh, but we were in an auditorium that I just kind of remembering. Um, um, uh, Mayor Warden coming by, Mayor Warden speaking. Um, uh, the crowd seemed a little sparse, but this is this is great. This is it's it's good to come to to Nashville. A lot of people enjoy uh, coming out this way. I'm assuming we're probably going to go to Knoxville or something. Uh, Knoxville or something, something next. They're already shaking their heads, saying, "Oh hell yeah!" <laughs> uh, so uh, looking looking forward to doing that as well. I, I really enjoy uh, enjoy doing this. Um, what I want to talk about today, as soon as we can, as soon as we can get this up, is what it's going to take for us to get to the next level um, across the state. A lot of the things that Mayor Dean talked about are uh, things that I was uh, very, very uh, privileged uh, and honored to help get started and be involved in. Um, and Nashville and Chattanooga, where are the Chattanooga folks? Where are the Chattanooga folks in, in the room? Okay, yeah, see. Yeah. Uh, I always, and I'll tell the story again, when I worked for the city of Nashville, uh, every time I applied for some kind of grant uh, or something, uh, I always knew two things uh, for sure. <laughs> and Greg is already laughing. I always knew two things for sure. Chattanooga was either going to beat us out, uh, Chattanooga was going to beat us out, and, and Memphis was going to come dead last, and they were going to suck. <laughs> uh, and, uh, huh? I'm, I'm just, just, just being honest. Chattanooga has done a great job of setting a, a reputation for themselves as a, a great outdoor city, a city where you can live and be active. And for many years, Memphis was just way behind on this issue. And you guys have stormed ahead right now. And I love it. I love the fact that all the, the cities, Knoxville included, um, th there's a lot of competition going on. I think Knoxville has a bike share program, um, something like that, electric bikes or something like that. But Chattanooga definitely does have a bike share. They, um, you guys got a little bit ahead of us. Um, I was excited to get, well, here's, here's my bragging right, right here. I got the first free bike share program in the state started. So yours, yours was a fee-based system. Uh, we started what's called the green bikes in the parks um, uh, when I worked for the city. And then the, the B-cycle came, came right after that. So... Um, I'm excited to see all the, all the growth going on. For 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 the state of Tennessee, uh, for TDOT to to continue to embrace this issue, there's going to take a lot of continued pushing from you all, and just not the you know what I the term I use is the usual suspects, the people in the bike clubs and stuff. It's going to have to get beyond that. It's going to have to be you know mothers and 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 and, and you know uh, school di school districts. Um, uh, it's it's business community. It's going to be a lot of folks going to have to be, keep um, 
keep pushing um, on this issue for us to really get to a point where we are um, we are a great state to bike in. Jessica, uh, everybody knows Jessica Wilson. Wave, Jessica. Um, she, she, everybody knows she's our state bike pad uh, program manager. She does a great job. She's gotten the state to a point where um, we're uh, improving in rankings. I think we were second in the southeast. And oh, well, that's that's good. You guys are laughing. Oh, oh, okay. You got. If you guys want me to start doing push-ups or lifting weights or something, I can. I can. I, uh, I can. I can do some backflips too. Some some working out. Uh, if 260 pounds land flat on my face. Uh, I don't know who's going. Thank you. Thank you. No. All right. So I, I'm just, I'm just going to jump right to it right here. I'll just start here. This is not the first slide, but I'll, I'll, I'll just go right here. Um, we're at a crossroads uh, as a nation. I don't think a lot of you know Everybody in this room knows what's happening from a transportation standpoint um, across the country. But we're basically, we're basically about to run out of money um, as far as transportation funding for this country. And by September of this year, uh, we're officially supposed to be completely insolvent, meaning the $51 billion what the federal funds that pays for transportation across America is going to run out. Um, Projections right now show that by July, early August, that money is actually going to be gone. This is transportation. Everybody knows it's long been the backbone of what makes this country great. Uh, we have, you know, a great education system. Some some people will argue probably not. We have a great um, economic um, engine in major cities throughout this country. But what's really made that happen from the Eisenhower days up to now um, has been this. But over the last 10 years. Our investment has continued to go down in this area. So if it completely goes down, if you've, you've seen Commissioner Short talk about this, uh, my boss, the Commissioner of Transportation for the state, this is how much money we're going to have in Tennessee next year in federal dollars. If you don't understand that, uh, Ling uh, is Chinese for zero. If you can't read, uh, zero dollars, zilch. That's how much money we'll have. In my native tongue in Nigeria, Odo, Odo means zero. That's how much money we're going to have. We're going to be in a very, very dire state. What, what does that mean dollar-wise for us? I'm sure a lot of you don't know how, how we get funded. $1.8 billion is our annual budget at TDOT. $920 million of that is federal money. $920 million. So a little bit over 50% uh, over of our funding comes from the feds. So if, if Congress doesn't act, if a bill does not get passed by September, Imagine what's going to happen. Maintenance of roads, new construction, a lot of stuff is going to get left behind. And a big part of that is why you guys are here today, the biking component. A lot of the money that we use for, for maintenance of roads to do some of the work that Jessica does when we're doing road diets or expanding, uh, expanding roads to add bike lanes, a lot of that money, gone, if Congress does not act. All right, so we're, we're, how do we spend that $1.8 billion? This pie chart is... is, is um, is unlike any that you will see in any other state DOT across the country, any other one, because up to roughly 90, 91% of our dollars, uh, these, two, uh, these two parts, these three parts of the pie uh, go directly to projects, go directly to projects to make things happen. So when, when you guys are pumping uh, gas at the gas pump, the return on your investment is at a 91% rate. It's going right back into projects. 2% of that, uh, the commissioner likes to, my boss likes to brag about this, only 2% of it goes here to the administrative side. So less than uh, $45 million of that $1.8 billion goes, um, goes, into, uh, it goes into the administrative side. So we're, we're spending our dollars wisely uh, in Tennessee. One of the things that we've decided to do uh, last year and this year at TDOT is um, do a customer survey. The last time we did a customer survey was, I think, probably um, in 2006 when I was still working for the city. 
but we decided to do a, a, another survey as a part of our long-range plan. We're updating our statewide long-range plan. And this question is uh, one of my favorite questions that we ask in, in the survey. And did you guys uh, uh, get um, Patsy Mims? Has she come by? She's from our staff. She's probably coming today. Somebody's going to talk about this more from what I, what I heard. But of all the questions we asked, and we asked like 1,000 questions, and more than 3,000 Tennesseans participated in this, a very statistically valid survey, very much so. Um, this, so we asked elected officials, we asked partners, and partners are people like you, MPOs, RPOs, uh, county, um, uh, county uh, planning departments, city planning departments, those are partners and we ask residents. So the, the most interesting part of this survey is the fact that in the first uh, column, the residents column, there is no red. Uh, there is no red. And you, everybody sees what red is. Any elected officials in here? I like to boo elected officials. <laughs> no, nobody, no, no elected officials. You guys got to edit that out of the tape. But anyway, um, building new highways is something that uh, a lot of uh, elected officials, um, as you can see, focus on. It's number two priority for them when they were surveyed. The number two priority, they said, we gotta build more roads, build more roads. When you ask residents of the state, here, here are the things that they say are important. Those are the things that they say are, 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 are important to them and building new roads is not one of them. So this, there's consensus across the board in two areas, in number one and number four. Uh, we need to maintain the great assets that we have in the state. Maintain them, take better care of them. And number four, uh, expand public transportation, which is a big uh, a, a multimodal uh, component in, um, in our eyes at, at TDOT. So, you know, maintaining what we have better, expanding public transportation, a key part of, again, why you guys are here today. And uh, residents, again, don't really feel like um, building, you know, new roads is where we should, um, where, where we should focus. So I thought a very, a very interesting uh, uh, result in this survey. So, so uh, mobility needs for seniors. We know uh, all the trends are showing that, well, a lot of people call it the silver tsunami uh, is happening or the graying of America is a topic that, um, you know, it's, it's just taken off all across the, Absolutely. I think um, in 20 years or so, 20 years at the uh, horizon of our long range plan, I think 15% or so of Tennesseans will be 65 and over. 15%. That's pretty significant. Uh, and so how do we get seniors to uh, that still want to work to work? How do we get them to uh, places where they you know, want to play, shop, whatever they want to do? More than likely, that's not going to be driving a single occupancy vehicle. So it's walking, it's biking, it's improving transit. So number five there is really connected to, uh, it's connected to this. I mean, it's connected to a lot of this stuff, but it's something residents feel, uh, residents brought up, the, but nobody else has seen that. Partners didn't say it's important. Elected officials didn't say that's important. So. Yep, as, as transportation is what you're saying, as a mode of transportation, absolutely. So a big part of what we're doing at TDOT right now, again, is updating our long range plan. We're, we're taking a very multimodal uh, uh, approach to, to, uh, to updating uh, the, the long range plan. The last long range plan for the state of Tennessee uh, at the state level was done, uh, was completed in 2005. So it's almost 10 years since we've had a vision for where we want to head. Um, for, uh, for, for transportation. And we're, the, our approach, we've got some of our great planners in the room. Uh, OCT staff, raise your hand, wave. Larry, Katie, Stacy, these guys are going about uh, communities across the state doing detailed presentations on, on our long range plan, saying, you know, what do you want to see in the future? What do you want uh, Tennessee's transportation uh, system to, to look like? In, in every single sense of the word, every single mode, uh, where do you want us to invest? What types of modes uh, uh, do you think are important? So there's going to be a heavy emphasis more than ever. I cry all day and whine all day about this at the department to the point where people are just kind of like blue in the face like, man, will you shut up? Uh, but this is for us to be the great state that we're supposed to be. If we're going to be 
very uh, successful economically, um, uh, from a livability standpoint, from a health standpoint. Tom? Sure. Look, I, I think, sure, I think we could do a better job of that. I, I think we are, we're, we are doing that. For example, that survey that I was showing early on, that, that I was just showing before, I'll just quickly run back to this. We, there were, a, a, it was a menu of options for people to look at of what they thought was important. On this list, on the resident side, I think, okay, there were 12 total questions. Biking came in number 11. Pedestrians and biking, I was shocked. But of 12 questions, that was number 11 and 12. But again, that's a balance of 3,500 people you know, across, across the state. So a lot of those people could be rural folks who are thinking pedestrians, you know, what, what is that? You know, biking, I, I, I don't need it. Yes, 11 or 12 of, of, uh, of importance where we need to focus over the next 25 years. So it's hard, we could do a little bit better. Katie, you were gonna say something? <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I heard the words that I hate the most when I, when I come up to speak. Jessica walks up to me and says, hey, Tokes, you know you only have 10 minutes, right? I said, <laughs> everywhere I go, that's what I, the first thing I hear, you, you know I only have 10 minutes. All right, so I'm going to rush through the rest of this because I do want to get to the next speakers. Um, so. One of the things that we've been working on is actually defining what multimodal means for Tennessee. I mean, wh wh what does that mean? We hear that word a lot, and some people really have no clue what it means, but wh what it means uh, to us in Tennessee is more connections and choices. That's the way we're gonna be defining it across the, this, across the state now. Whenever we go into a rural community, whenever we go into an urban community, suburban, whatever, we're gonna say, how would you like you know, more connections or more choices to, to be able to get to where you wanna get? You know, instead of always depending on one single way of being able to get there. I have a grocery store that's about two miles away from my house where I live in southeastern part of uh, the county, Antioch, Laverne area. I have never, never biked to, to that grocery store two miles away, never. The road that leads to it, um, uh, Stones River Road, 10, uh, 10 foot travel lanes, complete drop off, no shoulder, uh, um, a, a, a guardrail, right on one side, and the other side, a ditch, complete drop off, 10 foot lane, two miles away. Every time I need to get bread or milk, it's a drive, only two miles. But we have so many roads like that across the, across the state. So offering more choices um, uh, to people is one of the things that we, we, we really wanna do. Uh, you know, again, uh, Mayor Dean talked about this. Uh, what is this gonna do? It's gonna keep more, uh, more people excited about Tennessee. It's gonna attract a great workforce. Uh, support a lifestyle that Tennesseans, uh, uh, Tennesseans here can, 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 can enjoy. Uh, keep Tennessee residents as healthy as possible. Uh, reduce things like, all you guys know about this, reduce obesity, asthma, and diabetes, uh, and improve safety for all roadway users. Uh, a lot of people think that, you know, when I talk about this issue sometimes, think, uh, you know, I'm anti, anti one mode. I'm not anti anything, but it's about providing choices, providing more opportunities uh, for people to be able to get about uh, the, the state in a, in a safe way. One of the most important things that I think we need to continue to stress and focus on, especially during these times, are the economic impacts of these types of investments. Um, there's a project going on um, that, that's in the works in East Tennessee. Anybody familiar with Mountain Goat Trail? Some East Tennessee folks uh, here. Um, uh, projections right now, estimates right now that with the five million dollar investment that, that that's that's made in the Mountain Goat Trail, the return on the, the investment, the annual impact that it will have, is one point two million dollars. So you know for sure in four or five years, 
you're going to get that return on, on investment. Uh, Maryville to Townsend Greenway, anybody familiar? F familiar? Okay. Uh, right in, yeah, right in you guys is in the neck of the woods. Um, $24.5 million estimated cost, uh, $2.66 return for every dollar that's spent. So we, we have to continue to stress this issue. This is the one issue that, in my opinion, is a, is a, is a, is a nonpartisan issue. It's, a, it's not as polarizing as many other issues we can talk about. We like to talk about folks in this room. We like to talk about, oh, how great it is for the environment. And people just tune out. Uh, how great it is for, for health. And people say, well, why does the government need to tell me how I should, I should live uh, a healthy way? What, what does the government have to do with that? But you're, everybody's got a pocketbook that they care about. And if they see that, you know, the more we make these investments, there's going to be a return personally for the community as well from a f financial standpoint, uh, the more they're going to want to see this. I'm not going to go through all of these. But UT uh, Knoxville, uh, we've hired a, a professor out there to do a research project for us to focus specifically on this issue. I don't think she's here. Dr. Chen's not here, is she? Okay. Dr. Chen from, from Knoxville, Tennessee, she's doing great work analyzing um, the impact. She's actually looking at uh, River, River Park, Riverwalk in, um, in Chattanooga. She's taking a look at that to see what kind of, um, what kind of uh, return on investment there is as far as uh, jobs um, and total value that's added to the community. And just a little bit more, I'm not going to go through all these because uh, it'll, it'll take forever to explain this. But again, looking at, you know, when we make these investments that some people frown upon, you know, what happens uh, as it relates to, to creating jobs, uh, to creating uh, uh, business excitement, business activity in communities uh, uh, across the state. So one of the key things that we are doing right now, one of the most exciting things I'm looking forward to, our staff being able to roll out, pressure's on. Uh, is what we're calling community planning, community planning grants. So we're doing a big long range plan as a state. Uh, but one of the things that we've identified is that there are many communities across the state that don't even have a simple, you know, bike pad plan. They don't know where they're headed, you know, transportation wise. Uh, so the big MPOs, you know, across the state, they do a great job. I mean, they've got the resources, they've got the capacity to do a lot of planning to see where they want to where they want to head but the smaller communities across the state really don't have they don't have access to the funds they don't have resources they don't have the capacity uh, to do this kind of work so we're going to be rolling out a grant uh, late summer early this fall um, that's going to focus on things like this we will fund up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars what the planning, uh, f f provide planning funds to do this, these kinds of projects. Corridor studies, you know, t that look at things like access management, you know, complete streets plans, uh, local design guidelines, all these kind of things. Uh, bike pad plan, road diet uh, analysis for communities. You know, to really get this, um, to really get this effort uh, to make t uh, Tennessee a more walkable, bikeable, uh, livable state, uh, these plans are gonna have to be in place. We can't just jump to building things. The planning component has got to be there first. So excited about uh, uh, us being able to get there. As far as the funding goes that we, um, that we dedicate to, uh, to uh, building bicycle and pedestrian facilities, what I call the usual suspects in funding, they're still there. Um, if you start at the top, the surface transportation program, STP, is the largest pot of money that we have as a state that can make more projects like uh, we're talking about happen. It's roughly uh, $200 million in that pot of money, but it, it's also the most sought after. Um, there's probably about $4 billion worth of projects in a backlog already waiting on that annual $200 million. So there's, there's a lot of dependence on that. So there are other funds that we, we as a department dedicate solely to this issue, transportation alternatives, uh, you know, the TE program, uh, Safe Routes to School, Congestion uh, Mitigation, Air Quality, CMAC, uh, and the Rec Trails program that TDEC, uh, the Environment and Conservation uh, Department, runs for us. One of the things that's uh, important to point out here is that many states across the country with the latest uh, transportation bill, MAP 21, had the option of taking up to 50% of these funds and spending them elsewhere, of these bottom four. 
the alternative safe routes, and many states, I think I counted a dozen was the last count that I did. A dozen states have said, eh, we don't really need alternatives. We don't really need safe routes to school. And they've shifted the funds um, into you know other regular projects. But in Tennessee, uh, we've said we're not gonna do that. So we're keeping. We're, we're keeping that funding uh, going to these, uh, going to these uh, types of projects. So I think that's, uh, that's a lot of credit goes to our commissioner for agreeing to, to do that. So one of the things that I think we've done that's the, one of the coolest, and Jessica and the, the planning staff have been uh, very involved in making this happen, is that we've created a specific program. And many of you in this room are aware of this already. I'm not gonna go into a lot of details. Um, but we've created a specific program called the Multimodal Access Grant to help fund uh, these types of projects, walking, biking, and transit projects across the state. Um, it's very unprecedented. There are very few states that have done, I don't, think, I, I don't think I've seen a state that has actually done this. We've set aside $10 million annually over the next three years to fund uh, projects that are multimodal in, in nature uh, across the state of Tennessee. 10 million, you may say, well, that's, that's not a lot for the whole state, but it's a big start. It's a huge start for us. And these blue counties you see on this map are where projects got funded. That's the mayor of uh, Clarksville. She got a $900,000 grant to do a major intersection improvement um, and provide transit improvements uh, on a major arterial in her city. And that's uh, Commissioner Schroer uh, taking that picture with her probably just three or four weeks ago when we uh, unveiled the, the grant recipients. So here, I think I'm gonna just play a quick video if I have time. <clears throat> For a small town like Sparta in White County, where the population is about 5,000, to receive $1 million is a lot of money. This is, this is going to be a major improvement for us. It will probably be more money than we'll spend on our infrastructure for sidewalks in probably 50 or 60 years. The city of Sparta, US 70 West Rockland Way sidewalk, a $1 million grant. This project includes improvements of a 2,212 foot section of State Route 1. The city of Sparta was just one of 13 communities across the state to be awarded nearly $10 million in TDOT's first multimodal access grant program. Grant number nine is Lincoln County, the courthouse access improvement, $496,000. $455. The fund was created in 2013 as a way for communities to improve the transportation needs of transit users, pedestrians, and bicyclists. Well, we were so excited when we first found out that TDOT was going to be making this money available. So Clarksville Mayor Kim McMillan and other city representatives applied immediately. We hope to do, and what we apply for the grant to do is perhaps build 41 uh, bus shelters to protect people from the elements when they're waiting on our public transportation system. In total, TDOT received 37 applications. TDOT is already looking for next year's recipients, so for more information, log on to TDOT's website and click on the grant information. Reporting for TDOT, I'm Deanna Lambert. Deanna does a, she does a great job. She's on our staff, formerly from uh, Channel 4. Uh, she does a great job of putting videos like this together. But I think this is one of the coolest things that we've done um, as a department so far. We're excited about what's gonna come uh, next year on the next round of uh, $10 million projects. So just a quick look at some of what the proposals uh, look like. This is uh, Knoxville's proposal. Where's Knoxville again? Knoxville folks, okay, yeah. So you guys are very familiar with this. Uh, I wanna add a bus stop here. Um, at uh, seven, 750 feet of sidewalk here, uh, you know, a shelter, but this Merchant Drive in Clinton, uh, another part of that same uh, corridor near the, near the intersection there, uh, Mark and, and sign a shared use at bike lanes uh, as a part of Turner Lane, and again, add sidewalks here on both pictures here, you see guy walking, guy walking. Did you guys stage this? Yeah. You drop the pedestrian there, uh, okay? But you can see, you can see pedestrians actually uh, actually using uh, using the road here, and so a bike lane, uh, bike, shared use uh, bike lanes, uh, a bike route or a shower is probably going to be a part of the design there. One of the things that we're looking forward to doing, I'm really looking forward to doing. Uh, Kyle, you're surprised to see yourself up there. Uh, uh, 
uh, is to um, actually get protected bike lanes um, built in Tennessee. Uh, I, I saw Kim, the pictures from New York, pretty impressive. I was a big fan of uh, 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 Commissioner Khan's uh, work uh, and met her a couple of times. She, she's done tremendous things in, in, in New York. But we got to get some of this stuff going in, in Tennessee. Uh, about four or five years ago, I was um, working with Federal Highways when I was still at city government to get the first green uh, symbols installed in the state because I wanted to go a different route. Uh, with the design and federal highways approved it. So we, Nashville actually did the first green bike lane symbol in the state. Uh, so to you guys, Chattanooga, uh, or Chattanooga, beat you out on that one. Uh, um, but, you know, we got to get beyond just, you know, uh, coloring, uh, colorings and markings. We got to actually get protected bike lanes. That's what's going to get people uh, of all demographics out biking. That's really what it's going to take. It's kids, children. I love the pictures of kids. Uh, riding, if, if a parent, as a parent, I'm going to feel comfortable with my, you know, nine-year-old son uh, riding with me. Um, I, I want something that's more protected. So we're going to get this project started uh, in, in Memphis. Jessica, what's the time in? Uh, okay. Okay. When we start repaving roads, uh, we're going to try to get this done. It's going to go from a, a six lane to a four lane and have uh, protected bike lanes on it, so we're gonna do a road diet, and um, we're gonna do a second phase, it looks like, in the summer uh, summer of 2015. One of the things that's pretty exciting that we've also done, uh, we've uh, partnered with um, Bike Walk Tennessee, Nashville MPO, and the cities and the counties uh, within this eight, uh, nine county region. I had some uh, big contingency up to my office the other day, uh, asking for money, begging for money, no, I'm just joking, you guys weren't begging. Uh, Asking, <laughs> asking for some support to, to actually sign this, um, this U.S. bike route, and we're, we're gladly going to participate uh, and, and, and be a part of uh, making this happen in Tennessee because, again, we know what it's going to mean from an uh, economic uh, development standpoint, economic activity standpoint, health of citizens, and uh, bringing tourism and, uh, and so forth to town. So we're excited and looking forward to that. So finally... We got to get to a point where um, we're gun ho crazy like this. Uh, we got to get Gary Hawkins. We got to get everybody out <laughs> uh, riding around uh, Nashville, riding around the state, um, uh, and and just plain clothes like this, uh, uh, in, in in their birthday suit. Um, so I, 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 do I think we can get there? I definitely think we can get there. I think we can make Tennessee a um, a, a great place uh, to walk and bike. Um, we've got so many assets um, uh, and, and resources uh, to help make it happen. And I'm excited. I feel privileged to, to be in the role that I'm in. If a lot of you don't know me, 12, uh, 13 years ago, I was hired as the first uh, bike ped coordinator uh, in Nashville. And I've slowly kind of bumped around uh, and gotten to the point where I am now. And I focus on this quite a bit daily. Uh, our planning staff um, and environment staff at TDOT do a great job as well of trying to make these things happen. So I I'm honored, excited again to be uh, invited. We got a lot of work to do, uh, but I definitely think uh, we, can, we can get there as a state. Looking forward to working with you guys to, to help make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Tokes. Um, yeah, uh, we have done a lot in the last two years at TDOT uh, as a state and has taken the lead on that. Jessica has been an able ally. Protected bike lanes, $30 million multimodal fund, that's big stuff, y'all. Uh, and so I'm proud of Tokes and happy to be supporting him. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Bridget O'Keen, uh, and I want to just say a couple of words about uh, her. She currently works uh, for Advocacy Advance. Well, she's part of the Advocacy Advance team, actually, as a staff member with the League of American Bicyclists. She's the um, uh, Advocacy and Programs Director with the Alliance uh, for Biking and Walking. Uh, but before that, uh, she actually 
helped to start uh, the, the Berkeley Student Food Collective after studying at the University of Colorado at Boulder. She's worked all over the world. She's worked in Thailand, as well as in Colorado, California, and Alaska. And we're very grateful to have her here because if we're gonna keep that federal money from being zero, I can't remember what it was in Tox's native language, but if we wanna prevent it from going all the way down to zero, it's because we're gonna have strong partnerships with folks like Bridget. So Bridget, please come, thanks for joining us. Okay, thanks. thanks, and um, so thanks, Anthony. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the advocacy and programs director for the Alliance for Biking and Walking, uh, which is a coalition of state and local bicycle and pedestrian advocacy organizations, which many groups in Tennessee are part of that. Um, and the Advocacy Advanced Partnership is a uh, partnership between the Alliance and uh, the League of American Bicyclists to increase public funding for biking and walking in communities around the country. Um, and I was, the, my first night here, I was uh, having dinner with some friends, um, unnamed, talking about uh, PowerPoints and, and presentations and what's most effective and how data and, and statistics can be really heavy and, and storytelling is uh, much more impactful when you're giving a presentation. I agree 100%. Uh, so once upon a time, um, Bridget O'Keefe went down to Nashville, Tennessee to give a presentation on a 300 page book on data and statistics. Um, so that's just setting the stage. Uh, this is actually pretty exciting. Uh, the Alliance for Biking and Walking released a biennial benchmarking report, which is the absolute total collection of every data point you can um, give and, and have for biking and walking. And I have about 10 minutes. So hold on to your hats. Uh, know that this is a resource that's available after today. Um, but 45, uh, 45 billion, this is the number of trips made by biking and walking in the US um, last year. So 41, million, 41 billion of that is walking and four billion of that is, is biking. Um, that's 11.4% of all trips in the US. Um, however, biking and walking make up 14.9% of all fatalities. Uh, so uh, you can see the disproportion of that. And for the first time ever um, last year, uh, more than 2% of all federal dollars were spent on biking and walking projects. Um, so we got to 2.1%. So that is a, uh, somewhat of an achievement. But as you can see, there's a long way to go to make sure that funding is proportionate to um, both mode share and fatalities. Uh, so the benchmarking report was started in 2005. It comes out every two years. Um, it's a, as I mentioned, it's a collection of data. It's to be used by agency staff, um, advocates, elected officials, um, to really build political will to see the changes that we want to see in our communities for safe um, biking and walking. Uh, the most recent report was just released three weeks ago. So this is brand new. Um, you can download it for free. Come see me afterwards if you want a hard cover. Um, I am from Rochester, New York, and I was recently passing through, and I was at the airport, and I pulled up a pamphlet that was a tourist pamphlet for, um, for Rochester, trying to get people there. We're talking home of women's suffrage. You know, Frederick Douglass is buried there, uh, home of photography, home of one of the best jazz schools in the entire country, the Erie Canal and the path along the Erie Canal. And right when you open the pamphlet, it says Rochester within 500 miles of one half of the United States and Canadian population. So the aim is to get, use data and get data and actually um, see the change that you want to see with uh, impactful data. So this uh, report um, is, it takes a look at all 50 cities um, or all 50 states plus 52 of the largest cities for the first time ever. We include 17 mid-sized cities. Um, so Chattanooga was among that uh, small group. So you can compare with peer cities um, on all these data points. Um, and it collected over 21 uh, data sources. Um, there are many national reviewers and also local reviewers, many of which are in the room to double check data. And it covers a variety of um, topics. Like I said, I'm gonna be running through these really quickly. Um, demographic information of all states, uh, some key population points. Um, and sorry if this is, I guess, off center a little bit. Um, but in Tennessee, 1.4% of commuters walk. Uh, that's lower than, than the average of all states. 0.1% um, of commuters bike, um, which again is lower than the state average. 
In the U.S., 51% uh, of the population are women. 51% um, of walking trips are women, but only 24% of bike trips. Um, in Tennessee, the number is 25%, slightly better than average um, but uh, across the United States, but still far away to go. Uh, the highest percentage of people um, who walk have a household income of less than $20,000. Um, in Tennessee, 50% of um, uh, people who walk to work in Tennessee have an income of less than $15,000. Um, so really, when we're talking about making it safer and easier to bike and walk, uh, this is an equity issue. It's, a, it's, a, um, it's an issue. It's, it's, it addresses health. It addresses safety. It does all of that. But it's really about access and, um, and the ability to get to where you need to go safely. Um, in, so in cities with uh, higher percentages of biking and walking to work, there's actually um, lower rates of fatalities. Um, so you can see in, in Memphis and Nashville, um, the more facilities that are on the ground, uh, actually the safer, that, the safer that it is. And the more, um, the more often that people uh, bike and walk to work, the safer that they are. Um, for seniors, uh, seniors are at a are disproportionate risk for safety and, and bicycle deaths um, in the US. Um, as we all know, uh, biking and walking has a positive impact on physical activity levels, um, but also on health levels as well. So um, by walking and biking to work, um, at least 20 miles, uh, biking to work at least 20 miles um, a week actually decreases uh, the risk of um, breast cancer for women by 50%. Um, we know that even though, un unfortunately, in the United States, uh, our health is decreasing, um, we're seeing that biking and walking is really on a trend line to help address issues of uh, diabetes, obesity, heart disease. Um, Jim talked about this a little bit uh, when talking about bicycle tourism. Um, Tokes discussed uh, the economic impact and how important that is to make a case for biking and walking. Um, infrastructure projects uh, create more jobs per million dollar of spending, if it's a biking and walking infrastructure, than on road uh, infrastructure. Um, more money is going towards labor than uh, materials. Uh, this is from uh, East Village in, in New York City. Um, actually, when people walk or bike, they make more trips. They tend to spend more. So this is a, a survey showing that if, if we make it uh, easy and comfortable for people to do their trips by walking and biking, they're actually going to spend more than taking the car and doing the car trip uh, once a week and doing all of your purchases at that time. Um, and we use this example all over the country. Um, Broad Street is pretty exciting to see the, the transformation that's been happening. Um, <clears throat> Uh, to, uh, putting private investments um, or putting investing in Broad Street to uh, increase the biking in a disinvested area. We had 16 new businesses um, that have opened up, and some of those business, business owners have been talking about um, their their growth, the revenue, and uh, the positive impacts that this has had. Uh, so we also know that it has it impacts real estate. Um, in Indianapolis, for, um, for every half mile close to the, the tr uh, Monon Trail there, um, exactly, otherwise identical houses were 11% higher value. So uh, there's also, as uh, impact of healthier, healthier population, we're seeing a decrease in uh, health-related cost savings. Um, and of course, impact from, from events and tourism. On bike, people are stopping more. They're stopping communities more. They can carry less. Uh, they're stopping into, to have more meals, and they're, it takes them longer to take the same trip. Um, so that uh, positively impacts many small communities. So <clears throat> going back to this chart that shows the disproportion um, of funding, uh, bicycle and pedestrian projects, 2.1% of the whole pie. Um, and this is really where that money is coming from. I saw Toke speak last year in Memphis at the, at the Tennessee Bike Summit. 
and I was really excited to have him list CMAC, STP, um, all these programs as the usual suspects, because uh, really in, in many states and communities, they really go for the Safe Routes to School, Transportation um, Alternatives Program, Recreational Trials Program. But really, biking and walking are eligible for this whole pot. Uh, so there's, there's many opportunities out there, but with this 2.1% um, last year, so that's uh, per capita $2.11, um, last year, that paid for over 2,000 projects in all 50 states and um, provided over 8,400 jobs on those projects. So uh, these are really smart investment. Uh, I get a lot of bang for the buck, and it shows how far these dollars can go. For that same amount of money, you can build 15 miles of, of interstate highway. So. Um, one thing in, in Tennessee is that uh, zero dollars of um, highway safety improvement program dollars going to biking and walking. So uh, you see the fatality rates, and there are, many, there are many states who are tapping into highway safety dollars to directly pay for infrastructure that's going to make it safer to walk and bike. Um, so I say, actually, it's, it's kind of the way, it's weird the way Tennessee codes it. So we actually do spend safety funds on bicycling and walking, but when we code it into the federal program, it's coded because we're, fund, we're, you know, we're funding improvements for better vehicles, pedestrians, bicycles at the same time. So it's not coded as a bike pet only project. Uh -huh. A lot of times it's kind of a little misleading. Yeah, so actually, um, this is uh, talk, the, the, this, the slide I'm about to get into, but, um, but uh, the report also talks about how all states are planning for biking and walking. Um, and this is for Advocacy Advance. Um, we, Work in, uh, we work with partners, advocacy and agency staff partners um, all over the country to talk about how you can increase um, public funding, particularly federal dollars for biking and walking. We're going to be in Chattanooga on July 10th. Um, but we just released a report uh, lifting the veil on bicycle and pedestrian spending, um, which actually takes a look at every state's um, transportation improvement program to show how they're planning for biking and walking. Uh, and that includes elements of you know, how um, projects are, are coded and taken out. And, um, and my colleague, Ken, is actually going to talk about that uh, at the next session. Um, so complete <coughs> streets policies, Nashville is highlighted in this um, report as to how the Nashville complete streets policy um, came to be and how important Mayor Dean's, the political um, influence of Mayor Dean was to, to get this uh, policy passed. So Memphis and Nashville are both pretty, pretty low on the um, scale for bicycle infrastructure uh, per square mile. But uh, as uh, Kyle was, was talking about yesterday, whoever was at, in his session, um, the planned projects that have been uh, planned and funded through 2016 is a 338% increase um, since 2010. So that's really fantastic to, to see um, how uh, even though down on the list, how you can plan to like keep keep uh, making improvements, and um, 2016 will be exciting to see that report. Um, for the first time, this report talks about transit and bike share. Uh, so both um, the Nashville and Chattanooga um, systems are highlighted. And then uh, finally, um, in in one of the one of the ways that we collected information was to pair up with the bicycle friendly state survey with the League of American Bicyclists, um, and uh, and so state contacts were asked um, questions about what kind of education efforts uh, they have in the state. Um, so as you can see, uh, Tennessee is is above average has has a lot of education efforts. Um, still opportunities to. Uh, to have additional um, events and, and events. Um, open streets initiatives is one way that um, really gets the community involved. It's, a, it's an easy access to biking and walking. I actually was just in a, um, I was just at a conference about ballot measures and communities all over the country who are working on ballot measures. And nobody knew that I was there uh, representing biking and walking. And I was in a small group with um, someone who's working on a Move LA, so a ballot measure in LA, that is going to provide $90 billion for um, transportation 
over the next 45 years. And he was talking about how that's going to be split up through the sales tax. And, um, and over 4% of that is going for biking and walking. So over 4% of, uh, of $90 billion, over 4% of, of uh, $2.8 billion a year is going to go for biking and walking. And he said, you know, we, we did this before. We did this five years ago. We passed it. It was great. The bike ped people were not involved at all. We think maybe that was a missed opportunity. He's like, but this time, they are key partners. Like when you have an event that gets 100 people out, um, or 100,000 people out on a Sunday street, open streets event in downtown LA, those people have to be part of the equation. So really seeing how, how open streets that really uh, gets people out and experiencing their streets in a different way can be used as a tool for advocacy and political change. So in summary, um, nationally, uh, for the, uh, the commuting um, by biking and, and walking after decreasing over many years is starting to increase, but it's still very slow. There's a lot more that we can do. Um, women are biking at a disproportionately low rate. Uh, US health is, is still decreasing. Um, fatality rates have been decreasing for a long time, but over the past couple of years, we're seeing an increase. Um, in biking and walking fatalities. And a uh, disproportionate amount of federal dollars are going towards biking and walking. Uh, there's some good news, too, um, about more, more policies and goals being adopted. We're on a trajectory where we're going to continue seeing these um, great improvements. Uh, specifically in Tennessee, um, you really have plans and goals in place um, for, for these um, improvements. Unfortunately, uh, Tennessee is, is pretty low on the list as far as um, number, number 49, I'm thinking 49 in commuter uh, bicycling and walking levels, um, and uh, number 50 in, in percent of the population getting recommended physical activity levels. So it's great to see uh, these plans in place to see uh, improvements. So um, some suggestions for Tennessee that are probably similar to the bicycle friendly um, state survey that just came out, um, increasing spending for biking and walking, uh, making sure that the, the statewide complete streets policy and local complete streets policies are implemented, um, and that it results in more infrastructure for biking and walking. Uh, so uh, that is a taste of all of the, um, the research that goes into this report. Um, you can download it uh, for free online, or you can get a hard copy. Uh, but really important for, for using it as leverage points for making change, whether you are agency staff or elected officials um, or advocates, uh, to figure out where the opportunities to, to grow are and how um, Tennessee and cities compare to peers. Um, and so there's more resources from the Alliance uh, available, um, including a leadership retreat that's happening this September. Um, and I'll end it right there. That was an impressive amount of information. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce to you guys Mr. David Kleinfelter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm going to be fairly brief. Isn't that great? I was initially told that I had about five minutes to give the history of bike advocacy in Nashville, which, yes, relative to lots of things in the world, the history of bike advocacy in Nashville is short, but not really that short. Um, so I'm going to take the time instead. And I'll give you, I'm going to give you a short. I'm going to do what I was asked to do. But I'm also going to be a cheerleader for a moment and really cover two things. The first is to again thank some people who we've been thanking a couple times and we're actually going to thank again near the end of this. But, um, but hey, they work for us at Walk Bike Nashville and I want to make sure they don't get forgotten. And we're just going to um, again remind you of Nora Kern, who's um, contacted everyone, who's done a great job. <laughs> She'll get thanked later. You can do that later.
Well, well, while you're up, so you don't have to, you don't have to sit down and stand back up. Yeah. And then Liz Thompson, executive director. And Adams Carroll, whom I don't see, but I'm guessing he's working on the tour. He's working for the tour. So Adams Carroll, give him a, an abstentia standing up. And it's, I mean, you know, those of you who haven't had a chance to meet her and find out, Nora is, you're two years out of Williams, right? One and a half years out of Williams College. Never done anything like this before, which is completely impossible to believe. Adams, uh, she's our program manager, is that what we're calling you? Program coordinator, and then we have program manager Adams Carroll. Pro, uh, Adams has been at this since um, 2011 when he started as a volunteer. He then worked on the 2013 tour. Um, we kind of jokingly call him a man of mystery because Adams will tell you, oh, I, I've got some other things I have to work on. I can't do anything this week. And you'll find out that in the meantime, he revamped your entire website. So his, whenever he's working on other things, it always ends up being walk by Nashville things. So Adams is, is an incredibly hard worker. And then Liz, the executive director who has been hired less than five months and helped be the glue to bring all of this together and tomorrow's great tour. And, uh, well, she came here, I think it's important just so you know her history. She came from uh, the Monroe Carroll Children's Hospital where she worked for the Healthy Children's Program for six years, over six years. Um, but she's, her job is to make sure that Walk Bike Nashville um, establishes a sustainable business model so we can thrive into the future beyond the four-year grant that we have from the MPO, and we are well on the way to doing that, both in organizationally and, and financially. There's others we could thank for the summit, and we'll, we're going to do some of that later, so I'm, I'm not going to go there. So that's the first thing, again, to take some time to thank people. And the second thing is just to take a moment where, when we're always talking about what we need to do, where we need to go, and how things aren't great, but to step back and remember where we've come from. Um, the work is far but done. The work is far from done, not far but done, far from done. But let's take a look at where we've been. Um, Adams tells me that he did a little history that in 1970s, around that time, there was a, uh, um, the wheelman, the Nashville wheelman. Does anyone know or remember the wheelman? It was like in the 70s. Okay. Did you all advocate any? <laughs> yeah. And I, I know, I didn't think so. She, he said there's, he's, there's newsletters that show they were looking to get a velodrome, and, and we still don't have one, so get back to work. <laughs> and uh, the second um, group, that is Harpeth Bike Club, has been around for quite a while, and they had an advocacy committee. But, um, you know, I'm going to have to tell you the history for me is when, you know, when I really started on it, that's what I know. And um, that was um, in the 90s. I was on Metro Council from 90. Four through 99, and um, we started the transportation and safety, transportation, sorry, traffic and pedestrian safety task force. In 96, you didn't make it about bicycle and pedestrian task force because people would say, what's the point? Who cares? So you threw traffic in there and it, and it worked. Um, that group met and then put it out a report in 98. It was led by other council members and other people. Um, recommended a traffic calming program, which we had nothing like that here, a bicycle and pedestrian advocacy committee, which we have now and actually had one shortly after this, increased funding for sidewalks, a creation of a bike ped coordinator and an overall citywide bike ped plan. Um, shortly after that, the bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee was formed. That's one of the most boring slides you're ever going to see, but that's the resolution that created it in 1998. And that group, I, one thing I think was funny about it, the scene has been a wonderful sponsor provided advertising, Nashville scene for, for this event, for the tour. But in, in 2000, when this group promoted um, hiring a bicycle pedestrian coordinator, they just poo-pooed the whole idea. Oh, that's a stupid idea. What a waste of money. So, you know, the world does change. Um, then, roughly at the same time, uh, I sent out some letters. I, as a council member, I got lots of calls from people saying we need better sidewalks, we need better biking conditions. And we had, in 1998, roughly the same time as that first Bike Ped Advisory Committee, um, the first meeting of Walk Bike Nashville. And as you can see, it's like, what, what would we be called? <laughs> we didn't know, it, you know what it was going to be at that point. Um, and that group, that first board members, we have two of the four board members in addition to myself who are here. Bob Murphy, who the transportation engineer extraordinaire, and Tom Grooms were both on that board. And Tom would like to tell you that many times I told him, I just need you for one or two years. And after 10 years, we finally let him retire, um, which is five years ago. 
Um, the other board members, I don't think, are, there's Glenn Warner, who's very active in, in bicycle activity, still and his wife, Anne, um, who literally wrote the book on bicycling in Middle Tennessee, if you're not familiar with Glenn and Anne. Um, and Tom, I just want, I made a note here I want to mention, he's great about mentoring bicyclists. Someone says, hey, I, I want to ride to work. Tom will always step up and, and you know, help them learn how to do it. We had a person that contacted us and said, I flat out don't know how to ride a bike. I'm an adult. I want to do it. And Tom always steps up and does that kind of thing. And Bob, as I've joked earlier, does everything bike ped, including renting his basement to us at a very low rate. Uh, so that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, but so what did we have before 1998? Um, I mean, what bike was created, we weren't the sole, perp sole reason all these things happened. Those other groups helped too. But we had zero bike lanes before 1998, and now we have many miles of lanes. I don't really know what the number is because typically, Michael, do you know the number of lanes? <laughs> nah, but he counts, the, he counts labeled um, bike routes. So that's why I'm saying I don't really know what the lane is, <laughs> which is great. We got, a, we got a great, don't get me wrong, we got great stuff, but it's not that many lanes. Um, we have a greatly enlarged greenway system. There was a tiny, tiny greenway system in 98. Um, we did hire a bike ped coordinator. We've had a, a couple good ones for many years. It was Tokes, who many of you know, who was trained here at Metro by a lot of people and now works at TDOT as a big shot. Um, the bike ped plan was adopted, prepared by Bob and, and Hawkins Partners, and that's the main two people, right? And um, in 2003 is when it was first adopted, which is one of the earlier cities to have those. Um, major overhaul, the Metro Code, we have uh, three foot laws here before it was adopted statewide, which was nice. Music City Bikeway, which is, goes all the way from Percy to Percy, Percy Warner to Percy Priest, which was another of, Glenn, which Glenn Warner, that was his brainchild. And um, in addition to that, Glenn also thought of the Tour de Nash, which you've been hearing about repeatedly and, and ad nauseum, I'm sure. But it was his idea, and he put that first one together, um, and he's one of those guys that ran around and did everything with it. So Glenn had those two great ideas that and the, it was really wonderful about two years ago to see the Music City Bikeway finally come to fruition after he'd been preaching for that for many, many years. So that's, that really is the history of advocacy in Nashville. We've had um, the good fortune of having supportive mayors. This is Bill Purcell at the very first Walk to School Day. Remember, we are a walk bike Nashville, so we do some walking stuff too. This was, I want to say 98, but I didn't think we did it in 98. Then I wanted to say 99, but he left office in 99, so unless we did it right before the changeover in mayors, but so it's 98 or 99. And um, for those of you who know something, that's the same banner we've had for 15 years. We really need a new one. Um, <laughs> Mayor Dean, as we said this morning, for those of you who are at Bike to Work Day, he has participated in and many times ridden in uh, Bike to Work Day. I think he's got a new bike, doesn't he? Um, and then this is just, you know, we're able to do other things uh, through these other activities. We raise a little bit of money through the tour and the grant has helped. You can do things like training and then the thing just decided to take off on its own, which is good because I'm probably running over anyway. But, um, you know, uh, okay, sorry, the slide's changing through me. Um, Again, that's Glenn's idea. This is the first Tour de Nash. This is actually 11 years ago. We call it the 10th annual. Those of you who don't know, we had a little flood a couple years ago that was the one year we couldn't have the tour. So it is our 10th annual, but it's the 11th year. So um, that's a pretty good turnout. And we didn't expect anything like that that day. And I would, would, to sort of wrap it up, say, I don't know that four or five years ago, any of us would have expected that if you'd said, hey, let's get together people, everything from designers, advocates, um, government officials and just people who care and held a statewide bike summit that we'd have had you know, upwards of 100 people coming um, to this kind of an event. So there's progress being made. There's always room for more progress. And uh, let's keep up the good work. Anthony's going to introduce, you're going to introduce the next speaker, right? Thanks. Thanks a lot, David. Appreciate you so much. Thank you, David. Um, when I first met David, I'll sort of share this. Uh, Kyle and I and, um, and Matt Farr, yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was an arm wrestling match, and he won, and I was very embarrassed. Um, that, that didn't actually happen. It was an Indian re leg wrestling match. Um, actually, David said we, we came. We were some young bucks, and uh, you know, we, we've been at this work for a little while, but he's, he's been at it for a while, and he said, well, I thought when we met, you know, at first I would just say, welcome to the movement. And I was like, that David Kleinfelter. <laughs> I 
I didn't know whether to like take that as a compliment or anything, but it's it's been a great relationship that we've established between Memphis and Nashville. We worked through our sibling rivalries, uh, and I think have forged a great working relationship, and we're grateful for all that he's done. Uh, I want to take just a second uh, to ask Bruce Day just to come on up here, and, and I'm going to let him do his presentation, but before that, I'm going to shamelessly embarrass him. Um, I, I, want to, I want to talk about you for a second. Hold on. Um, yeah, we're going to embarrass you for a second. Uh, <laughs> David gave a brief history lesson about Walk Bike Nashville, and I just want to give you a very, very quick one about Bike Walk Tennessee. We were founded in 2009. And one of the first things that we did was we had to incorporate as an organization with the state of Tennessee. We had to file a charter. Bruce Day was the man who took that charter uh, down to the courthouse. Uh, and he got this organization set up on its feet five years ago. And he has worked tirelessly for every single day this organization has been around to make it a success. All of the finances that have gone into this bike summit and every bike summit that we've had have been administered by Bruce Day. He has served uh, in a, a role that is not glamorous, uh, and that often is not very fun, but he has done it with uh, an esprit de corps that has inspired me and I think our entire board. And I just want to thank you on behalf of the board for your five years of service uh, and let you know that even though you're going to be off the board, we're not going to let you get far. So thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Anthony. I'll take... Uh, right. oh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, Please, please sit down. Well, uh, thank Anthony for that great compliment. But he didn't know it, but, I, but he gave me one of the greatest compliments I ever got. Uh, before I ever met Anthony, we had been corresponding for a year while he was traveling around the world on his bicycle, and I was back here slaving over the uh, minutiae of Backwalk, Tennessee. <laughs> but we had an email correspondence, and when he met me, he said, Wow, you're a lot older. I thought you were younger. <laughs> <laughs> So, I, I, I can't help uh, when I was born, but I'm, <laughs> but I'm certainly glad that I pull off a, a masquerade of being younger than I am. Uh, so, uh, one other person that I think deserves some credit that hasn't been mentioned yet is Laurel Creech. Uh, Laurel Creech was present from the beginning of the planning this time, and she's responsible for obtaining these facilities that we're, working, that we're meeting in right now. And... Uh, we had to have the input of the mayor's office for several things, and any time uh, we needed it, Laurel was always there for us. So I don't see Laurel here right now, so if you see her, tell her thanks. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, when I, I was asked to give uh, an update of the status of advocacy in, of bicycling advocacy in Tennessee, and in short, it's pretty good. Um, I went to uh, start to plan to uh, get some figures and stuff, and when I was doing all that, I looked at it and I was reminded of a thing called the Curse of Kelvin. I don't know, how many have heard of the Curse of Kelvin? Uh, curse of Kelvin, K-E-L-V-I-N. Uh, though, uh, I'm sure Caroline has heard it. Yeah, you don't, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Lord Kelvin was uh, one of the pioneers in physical science in the 1800s, and he espoused the principle. He's, the Kelvin thermometer is named after him, for the engineers of you. He espoused the principle that said, anything you can measure, you know more about than anything you can't measure. And there's no denying that. I mean, you know, that's the truth. Unfortunately, ever since then, people have been trying to measure the unmeasurable. And even worse, they've been taking the data they get out of that and making hard decisions on it, thinking they've got hard data. Um, and so, to me, when I, as my under, undergraduate major was chemical engineering, so looking at it from a hard, cold science point, I said all that stuff I was looking at, the number of miles of uh, greenway we have, the bike lanes, is that due to us? Is that due to advocates? Or are we riding a crest of a population change? You know, sort of like the global warming debate. Is it humans or is it natural? And so I said, I really can't say that in any hard scientific way. But I can say that I ride on facilities every day, well, every day that I ride, that, are, that would not be there if it weren't for me. I went to city council meetings. I made presentations at planning boards. And the very first one I 
uh, presented that in about 2002 in Hendersonville, and I told them what we needed and what benefits the county uh, community could get of it, they laughed at me. I mean, <laughs> if you think uh, someone telling you that you're, um, that you're doing the wrong thing is bad, just have, some, have a group of uh, people in public laugh at you for your idea. Well, this last year in 2013, Dave Shoemaker and I got to meet with several of dozens of uh, very similar organizations, and none of them laughed at us. So I think we're doing fine. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>
Our roads often don't feel like they've been created for the benefit and enjoyment of the people either. Can our movement address itself to the need for such essential democracy in these public spaces? Enrique Peñalosa, mayor of Bogota, Colombia, in the late 1990s, he certainly believes that we can. In Bogota, he said, we built symbols of respect, equality, and human dignity, not just sidewalks and bike paths. He described high quality public pedestrian space as evidence of a true democracy at work. Closer to home, Memphis Mayor A.C. Wharton put it this way, our streets move us. They move us not just from place to place, in fact, they define life in our communities. Our streets are shared spaces that belong to everyone. I want to end this year's Bike Summit by naming that despite the audacity of working towards an essential democracy in our streets, this goal of designing public streets that reflect our nation's fundamental ideals is well on its way in Tennessee, thanks to you. Each of you and the work that you do the work you've shared here, it gives me personally hope that Tennessee is headed in the right direction. Certainly not on every issue, but on this issue. You are showing us, quite literally, how to build our nation's highest ideals into shared public spaces. You've seen sidewalks that are damaged, intersections that are dangerous, laws that don't exist, and bike lanes that are inadequate. And you have taken responsibility on yourselves in towns and cities across this state to make them better. You've taken your place at the decision-making table here in Nashville and in towns across this state, and you've joined your voice with a chorus of other voices to explain to commissioners and counselors, to neighbors and business owners, that sidewalks, bike lanes, buses, trees, slower car traffic, all of these make for better places to live, work, and play. In the 18th century, Alexis de Tocqueville said the success of a young nation would depend on such voluntary associations. He believed only the willingness of citizens to voluntarily join together would prevent this idealistic new republic from anarchy and oppression. Our alliances, these voluntary associations formed between advocacy groups and government organizations, neighborhood associations and business owners, they've led to vivid examples of what democracy and public spaces look like. Nashville's Shelby Bottoms. Knoxville's Urban Wilderness, Chattanooga's Walnut Street Bridge, Johnson City's Tweetsie Trail, the Hamp Line in Memphis. These places, spaces that are free, open, and inviting to everyone, they reflect your commitment to share responsibility for making Tennessee a great place. But democracy is also about choice. And although we've come a long way in Tennessee, most people in our state would tell you they don't feel they have a choice about whether to walk or bike. It's not illegal to ride in our streets or use a sidewalk. People simply don't, don't feel comfortable doing it. So the choice, while it's technically present, is unrealistic for most. We are on the front lines of battling for that choice. And we're here today because while we believe that it may not be an American idea, this notion of streets which welcome everybody streets defined by an essential democracy. This is something that has been tried, it's been tested, and it's been proven in cities across this country and in countries across our world. Last year, I cautioned against focusing on changing the culture. We often hear people say, you know what we've got to do here? The thing that we've got to get done is we've got to change the culture. And when we change the culture, then we'll have more people walking and biking. That just feels impossibly obtuse to me. It feels big and unwieldy. So where do we start creating these streets? How do we get there? I want to leave you with this. I think we start with 1%. And I don't mean the 1% that has become so popular in political parlance. I mean setting the goal of growing the number of people who bicycle in our major towns and cities to 1%. Right now, as Bridget shared with us earlier, statewide, our mode share is at 0.1%. In our bigger cities, it's usually between 0.2 and 0.3%. But to put a number on it, in the next two years, what I think we can achieve 
in our four major cities is to grow the regular cycling population by 20 to 30,000 people. That will help us reach a mode share of 1%. So how do we do that? We need more capacity. I'll say it again, we need more capacity. Every time I see Jeff Miller speak, uh, Bridget's boss, he talks about capacity. And that's what we need here in Tennessee. We've got to start on it. We have advocacy organizations in all of the four major cities now. Livable Memphis, Walk Bike Nashville, Bike Walk Chattanooga, and Bike Walk Knoxville, those last two are now subcommittees of Bike Walk Tennessee. Every major city in our state now has a biking and walking advocacy organization. And half of them have paid staff. So the goal now is to get the other half to the point where they can pay individuals to get up every day and think full time about biking and walking. <laughs> Community bike programs, I think this is another step. And I'm really glad that Chuck mentioned those in his program. We did not conspire on this. Community bike programs. Revolutions Community Bike Shop in Memphis, the Oasis Bike Workshop here in Nashville, the Main Street Bike Co-op in Chattanooga, and the Kickstand Collective in Knoxville. I believe these organizations are among the most valuable resources that we have in reaching the 1%. If you haven't been into your community bicycle shop, you can start with that. Just go in there and watch what happens. These are often the first point of contact for adults and kids riding their first bike in years. Sometimes their first bike ever. And they're always the place where you're going to find the most affordable bike. They support people who ride literally every single day. And they provide an immense opportunity to us, not only to educate people, as Chuck pointed out, about how to ride bikes safely, but also to build a strong and diverse coalition. A strong and diverse coalition. Every one of these organizations in Tennessee needs paid staff. Finally, the last group is government officials. These are among our best and hardest working allies in the movement. Jessica Wilson, Tokes, Bob Richards, Diana Benedict, all of these people work for the state of Tennessee, and all of them have been to all of our bicycle summits. That is a huge testament to you all and the work that we're doing, but also to their character and to their tireless work on this. They have been and they continue to be supporters of this movement, but they need more capacity. Our bike ped coordinators across the state, Kyle Wagenschutz in Memphis, John Livengood in Knoxville, Jason Radinger here in Nashville, Phil Pugliese, Ruthie Thompson in Chattanooga. This is a world-class crew of bicycle and pedestrian professionals right here in our state. They need more capacity. Our MPOs, we've got some of the best planners I've ever met. Leslie Meehan, Ellen Zaviska, Kelly Seegers, Jenny Park. More recently, we've seen excellent mayors and counselors elected to public office. Andy Burke out in Chattanooga, Madeline Rojero in Knoxville, A.C. Wharton in Memphis, Carl Dean, who spoke to us this morning. These folks need us as much as we need them. They're all facing cash-strapped budgets. Biking and walking is a solution. How can we help to provide that additional capacity? So there's a lot to keep up with across the state. Not even to mention the new federal transportation bill that's moving through Congress right now. Uh, Tokes mentioned this to you earlier. Um, you know, in late July or early August, funding for transportation writ large in the country will evaporate. It will be gone. There's, there will literally be no money. He was not exaggerating about that. Um, a couple of years ago when we reauthorized the transportation bill, the first thing that happened, one of the first things was they cut all dedicated funding for biking and walking. It was completely cut out. It took an all-hands-on-deck advocacy effort across this nation to get it back in. There was an amendment to the bill that passed by one vote. One elected representative saved funding for biking and walking, right? And then the votes went through and they passed the new transportation bill. Even after that, the funding took a hit. We lost a full third of the funding levels that we had had before, okay? So that's all I'll say about the federal transportation bill. But how do we, how do we pull all these pieces together? Government officials, local bicycle cooperatives, local advocacy groups. That's what Bike Walk Tennessee does. That's the mission of our organization, is to build this coalition to support local advocates to help to enhance capacity for government officials. That's what we were founded to do in 2009, and five years later, we stand poised to take the next step. Our goals for this next year, we want to support and expand the capacity of community bike programs, local advocacy chapters, 
We want to create one in Covington. We want to help found one in Dyersburg. We want to support people in Somerville. We want to strengthen Bike Walk Knoxville and Bike Walk Chattanooga and Nashville and Memphis. We want Tennessee to be the best place in the American South for people who walk and bike. Not number two. Watch out, Virginia. That's been the goal from the moment we were founded, and that's the goal today. So we're proud to have started this event uh, three years ago. We're glad that it was in Memphis last year and Nashville this year, and we're really pleased to say that it's going to be in Knoxville, Tennessee next year. We've got a great thing going here, y'all, and these voluntary alliances that we've created, this is the time when we get to strengthen those. That's the time when we get to see them. That's the moment when we leave energized to go back and do the tough work in our local communities. So we know we can count on you in the coming year, not only to make a great bike summit, but I hope we can count on you to also create this, this goal of, of, of creating democratic public spaces. And I think it begins with the 1% and moving back from there. The last thing I'll say is um, John Muir, he actually uh, went to Yellowstone and spent some time camping with Roosevelt. John Muir was the founder of the Sierra Club. And uh, Roosevelt wrote an interesting little passage reflecting on his time with Muir. He said, I was interested and a little surprised to find that John Muir cared little for birds or bird songs. He knew little about them. Birds were all the rage in conservation at that time. <laughs> the hermit thrushes meant nothing to him. The trees and the flowers and the cliffs, they were everything. The second night, we camped together in a snowstorm on the edge of canyon walls, under the spreading limbs of a grove of mighty silver fir. And then the next day, we went down into the wonderland of the valley itself. I shall always be glad that I was in the Yosemite with John Muir. I don't know that you need to go camping with your mayor uh, or that you need to take your counselors into the woods. That could probably be illegal. <laughs> but I would encourage you to think creatively in this next year. How do we reach that 1%? How do we develop additional capacity? We know where we want to go. We have a sense of commitment to this issue. And I think now, in the next year, we need to find ways to creatively build capacity to support these great efforts that are ongoing and ensure that our state continues to move up the rankings and becomes the best state in the American South as a start to being the best state in the nation for biking and walking. So thank you guys for coming. I uh, hope you had a great summit. The last thing that I want to encourage you to do is get a plate before you leave. This is like grandma's house. We want you to pack up some of the food uh, and take it with you because we're not going to. Uh, and it needs to get eaten. Uh, bike ride here at 3 o'clock. Tom Grooms is going to help. We're going to meet up outside. Uh, 4.30 at the Tennessee Brew House until 7.30. Get your tour to Nash Packet. Tennessee Brew Works. Not a house. Uh, and I said that I would give a big benediction. So go forth. Ride bikes. Live long and prosper. <laughs>